I was really, really hoping that when I uh, when when I answered this phone, it was going to be that the Yankees had just completed a four game sweep of the Baltimore Orioles, but it is not the case. Hi, Buster. Buster, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, you know, I I was I was really st- I wasn't starting to believe again, but I was starting to enjoy again. Well, and you do wonder if you know, those comments that Joe Girardi made last Saturday when he talked about Sunday's game being the most important plate around here in July in a long time kind of uh, you know, lit a fire in those guys where they understand you know, that they had a lot at stake, that there was a chance and there continues to be a chance that, uh, that this group of players is going to be broken up here over the next 10, 10 days or so. And uh, you know, they certainly took some good steps forward, but I doubt uh, this uh, five-game stretch has, has changed anything in terms of what they're planning on doing. ESPN's Buster only joins us, LeVac and Wolf. Buster, so the, still on the cell. There, there's no saving them, not even in this three games that come up with the Giants. Well, it may be go. there may be some levels to what go, goes on. Yeah, if they sweep the Giants and then uh, roll out of that and then they uh, go to Houston and make a dent, then it's probably going to be harder for ownership to feel like that they can sell and – you know, at the same time, I do think that there are going to be different levels of sales uh, where they could say, hey, trade Aroldis Chapman, get some return for him, maybe trade Carlos Beltran, and then see if you can win with the rest of the guys. And on the other hand, I think the full board thing would be uh, not only trade Chapman and trade Beltran, but also trade Brett Gardner. Uh, and I know they've had some, some conversations with other teams about that, trade Andrew Miller, uh, and I, you know, wrote a piece the other day that uh, if they do all that, if they rebuild, then they really should address the status of Alex Rodriguez and Mark Teixeira on the team if they're in fact turning over the roster. So you wrote about that 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 go go big if you're going to do it, take those guys yeah. out. Can you can you get anything from a, for a Mark Teixeira or an A Rod or is it just cut them loose? Well, you definitely can't get anything for Alex. Uh, you know, it's been a as we talked about in recent weeks, he hasn't hit since last August. Yeah, this is not. You know, a two-month thing. He's hitting about 200 since last August 7th uh, with a ton of strikeouts. So he wouldn't have any value, especially because he's owed $21 million for next year. But he's not a part of their future. And if you're going to turn over the roster, then go for that. I, I do think Teixeira probably would, would have no problem finding a spot with another team because he's a good defensive player, and, and he has been streaky during his career. But I doubt that the Yankees would really get anything interesting if they could save, you know, five hundred thousand dollars on the money they owe him for the rest of this year before he becomes a free agent. That would be one, a win. Uh, but I don't think they could get any, any prospect worth uh, worthwhile. Buster, what about uh, Tanaka? Is that a trade possibility? <clears throat> I don't think so. Uh, you know, and I haven't heard his name at all. The other factor is is that uh, you know his elbow is a ticking time bomb, and it has been for a couple of years, and so. Uh, you know, this time of year, if you're going to trade an ace prospect for a starting pitcher, you're going to want to make sure that you get a guy who is, uh, you feel pretty good about his chances of staying on the field. And given where Tanaka is with his elbow, it'd be a pretty hard bet. Buster only with us, 104.5, the team. Buster, um, I've been I've been kind of almost doing it in like a make fun of the situation kind of way, but with the Dodgers potentially losing Kershaw, do they now become a possible trade partner with the Yankees? And that's where I thought maybe a Tanaka could happen. I, I doubt it. Uh, first off, I my from my conversations with the, from uh, Dodger sources, it sounds like that they're just sort of still in a, in a gray area about what they want to do. Because, you know, a Dodger team without Clayton Kershaw, how good could, could it be? Do they really want to go out and, and uh, trade a group of prospects to try to prop up a team that <clears throat> wasn't very good anyway on the days that Kershaw didn't pitch. And I still think they're in decision-making mode there. I know they're you know, having conversations with teams like the Yankees about Andrew Miller, and uh, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised they're talking to the Brewers about Jonathan Lucroy and about some of the outfielders that are available uh, and maybe even some of the starting pitchers. <clears throat> My gut instinct is that this is not a team that's necessarily going to go all in for this year because they do have so many question marks with the rotation and the health. I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, every day you see another Dodger pitcher goes down, you know, goes down and it's I I don't think they should be surprised cuz so many of them have ugly injury histories, but when your most important player goes down, that probably changes the equation about how you want to invest in this season. 
So, Buster, we uh, Wolf and I are getting on a Dunkin' Donuts bus, mm-hmm. going to Yankee Stadium on Sunday, August 7th against the Indians. Wow. How different, we're bringing a bunch of listeners with us, how different is that team that we're going to see for the Yankees going to look that day? My guess is is that, uh, again, barring a, a, a huge comeback uh, over the next uh, you know 10 days leading up the trade deadline, uh, you know, a burst of victories, I think they're going to... Um, convinced they're going to trade Chapman, and I, I know that they've done a lot of aggressive work in that, and if we got a call tonight that Chapman had been traded, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I, I, I believe that Miller would be traded, because I don't think his value is going to be higher than it is right now, and you're going to get the most prospects for him of any of the Yankee players. I think Gardner's going to be gone. I think Beltran's going to be gone. I think it's less likely that Brian McCann will be gone, but who knows? You know, if, uh, for example, they were having conversations with Texas, and Miller came in, and they were trying to figure out a way to, you know, to work it out. And the Yankees ate some money. Maybe he would go, but I, I do think you're probably seeing 20 percent of the roster turnover by August 7th. Now, Buster Strasburg suffered his first loss since September. Why has he been able to be so dominant uh, in the NL East? Do you think? Well, I think Stephen uh, has had a transformation this year. And, and look, I, I don't know exactly what he's done. Uh, but I can tell you that just being around him in recent years, he's always been a guy who, and I really like him. I think he's a really good guy. But he's also, I think, an unbelievably shy. And he probably in a perfect world for him five years ago, when he pitched, he would probably prefer that it was in an empty stadium. You know, all the bells and whistles and the media stuff has never have never been his thing. And I noticed right away, and I heard from other people who noticed right away when they saw him in spring training, it was like he was a completely different person. And Dusty Baker said early this year, look, we have to figure out a way to try to make this more fun for Steven. And I see that. And I tell you what, he loses his first game today. Mm-hmm. I actually was impressed because he got hit around early. He was down 6 nothing, And in the past, you might have seen him look for the exit ramp in the third or fourth inning. Today, he wound up pitching six innings and kind of grinding out, save the Washington bullpen. Buster only with us right now on 104.5 The Team. Buster, if he wants to pitch in front of an empty stadium, he could become a Yankee. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of empty seats. Well, not seats. on August 7th. We've established that. We're, we're bringing the party. Uh, see, now you see how far Levesque has fallen. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm just being real. That's all. But Buster, staying in the NL East and staying in New York, what is going on with the Mets starting pitchers? It's like every. It's not if they're going to get hurt. It's when they get hurt. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's a horrible series of coincidences with Harvey going down, and you know they're sitting and, and waiting, and and if the team struggles and sort of drifts out of the wild card race, I'm assuming at some point they're going to send Stephen Matz out to get that bone spur taken care of in his elbow. Uh, Noah Syndergaard, you know, he, him with a bone spur. It, it, that's just the way it goes. It's just a, it's just bad luck. And, you know, I was having a conversation today with someone, and they were like, you know, is this a sign of something to come? And my answer was no. I think they could easily be back and, and be all be fine and, and then get back on the track that they were at the outset of this season. But, boy, it, it unraveled in a hurry, and it, it tells you exactly how reliant this team is on that great core starting pitching. Buster, as uh, as we uh, enjoy Mike and Mike every morning right here on 104.5 The Team, Rob Manfred today dropping the uh, the bomb that he's looking into limiting the use of relief pitchers. It's kind of a, a crazy idea when you first hear it. Well, I, he actually, there were a number of things that he said uh, in our in our session with him today, and I tell you what, it, it was it was eye opening. First off. You know the idea of of altering relievers and and adjusting those rules. You know, apparently that's been something that they've been talking about for a while. I I don't think it's crazy. I think they have to figure out a way to get the game shortened down, uh, and that's one of the places we've seen in recent years where there's more and more special specialization. Uh, you know, I saw a game in San Francisco recently where I think Bruce Bochy, the Giants manager, who's terrific at what he does, he's a Hall of Fame manager, made five pitching changes in a half an inning. Yeah, it's and, crazy. and we've had games on Sunday night where it feels like that uh, the pitching changes absolutely become a brick wall for the pace of game, and I think that's part of the reason why they're having this conversation. See, my idea was just to move the bullpen closer because <laughs> then they don't run in from the outfield. Uh, that didn't help that day in San Francisco where the bullpens are right yeah, near true, the field. So. True, true, true. 
Uh, bless you. So what, what else did, uh, did Manfred say this morning that really yeah. jumped out at you? Well, he said that uh, at the All-Star game, it's his hope that they get back to the point where they're, the, everyone's trying to do it to win the game. Uh, because we've seen in uh, over the last 15, 20 years, it's become a Little League participation thing where everyone gets to play. And Terry Collins, the Mets manager, said it after the All-Star game. You know, His goal was to get everybody, at least one guy from every team in the game. And that's completely different from the All-Star games when we were growing up as kids when you know, Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and yeah. the best players played the entire game. And I think that's where baseball is going to come up with a different formula for the All-Star game. And the other thing that really jumped out at me, because we've heard so much from so many different players about wanting to toughen the penalties for PEDs, uh, he, he said in, our, in the interview we did with him that he uh, – that from what he understands, that the union to this point has not brought that perspective to the bargaining table. And I can tell you this, if that's not introduced, there are going to be a lot of unhappy players if they uh, essentially leave the current penalty system in place because a lot of players want it toughened and they want the possible rewards for cheating reduced. Makes sense. Favorite stories, Buster, from this year's Hall of Fame class, including Mike Piazza and Ken Griffey Jr.? Boy, uh, well, and... and you know, Piazza, I just, I remember he had a home run off Ramirez Mendoza yeah. in an interleague game that I, 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 I think it probably still hasn't landed. I'll never forget the sound of it. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, the Roger Clemens stuff and, uh, you know, throwing the bat at, at Piazza, that, that was astonishing to me. You know, that series of events, he was such an unbelievable hitter. Probably had more personal stuff about Griffey, who I, um, you know, I was there. I'm sure you guys have seen the highlight of uh, maybe the, one of the greatest catches of all time when he absolutely ran full speed and, and uh, smashed into the wall in right center field in the kingdom and shattered his wrist, making a catch on a ball hit by Kevin Bass. I was there at that game, and I'll never forget the sound of him hitting the wall. It was amazing. Uh, but also just the, you know, I, I describe to friends, because I get asked all the time, you know, what's this guy like or yeah. what's that guy like? And I always say, that I think of all the stars that I've seen in baseball, the Ken Griffey Jr. probably is the one who liked the fishbowl of dealing with the media, uh, of being a star, less than any of the others. But I also say I think he would be, if he was your next-door neighbor, you would love him. Because I've seen him around clubhouse kids and uh, you know, equipment managers and people like that, and he's so great with all of them. Um, and you know what? All things being equal, that's probably what you prefer anyway. What an unbelievable player. A-Rod, uh, the A-Rod story comes up in my mind about Griffey. Is that where you're going to ask him? Wolf like excited to ask questions. But I was, the, the prank he played on A-Rod when, when A-Rod was a rookie. I can either confirm or deny that story. <laughs> How about the rumor? Can you confirm or I, deny I the I can't say that uh, I've expended any reporting time chasing that one down. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite Griffey moments was when he uh, batted uh, – with, with his dad. I mean, they were in the oh, line. Yeah. yeah, that was such a great moment. I and mean, I, I remember uh, Camden Yards when uh, they had the home run derby. I was there in 1992, the first All-Star game there, and, or maybe it was 93, and, and he hit the warehouse with a, with a home run. Oh. I mean, he just, he was a transcendent talent. You do wonder if he hadn't suffered those injuries and, and, and hadn't, maybe, maybe if he'd taken a little better care of himself in his 30s and not put on as much weight. Um, you know what numbers he would have put up because I don't think there's any doubt he probably have been ten most talented people who've, who've ever played the sport. Buster, I don't I don't know if you have the kind of time to do it today, but I, for the first time ever, I heard the story of your first pet on Mike and Mike this week. <laughs> All right, I can tell I can tell that story relatively quickly. Okay. Uh, I it was I grew up on a dairy farm in Vermont. Yeah, and when I was six years old, I got uh, my first pet was a Angus steer named Daniel Boone, and I named him, I was my, the old Daniel Boone show with Fess Parker, it was my favorite show, I had a coonskin cap that yep. was actually made for me from a real mm. raccoon from a local farmer, uh, and I had a buckskin coat, and so we named the, the, I named the steer Daniel Boone, and when he was two years old, and he was really big, and, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was made known to me very early in, in uh, his life that at some point he was going to become family hamburger, and so one day I went off to see my friend Jimmy Davenport and uh, spent the day with him, came back, and there were Danny Boone's stomachs on the backyard. Oh. And, uh, and that was the end of Danny Boone, and uh, it certainly was an indoctrination into life on the farm. See, but I think this is why Buster can put up with anybody. When you can go through that at like six, eight years old and go, 
oh, well, I guess we'll have some nice hamburger later. You you <laughs> learn to deal with anything. Yes, the, I, I do like the eating the family pet story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, that old movie, Babe, about the pig. Yeah. They have a great saying, which I thought was perfect for anyone who grew up on a dairy farm. And they said, that's the way things are. And that's the way things were. Buster, we appreciate your time as always. Where are you going to be this weekend? We've got the Dodgers and the St. Louis Cardinals on Sunday night. Very excited. Uh, you know, we'll see what the Dodgers say about having life without Clayton Kershaw. I'm shocked that you're not sneaking away to watch Bumgarner versus Tanaka in New York. Well, you know what? I- I'm actually I'm very excited sat- Saturday morning going to see Abraham Lincoln's uh, uh, gravesite. So. Uh, very fired up about it. Oh, man. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is like my all-time hero. Mine, too. My stepfather's name is Lincoln. Wow. And, so, and he's a very, very, very distant relative. And so since uh, I've been about seven years old, a huge nerd about Abraham Lincoln. All right, just for you, and you may have heard this, I have, a, I have my favorite Lincoln story. Okay. Back in the day, uh, when, when uh, before he was president, dueling still took place. You know, if you insulted somebody, they could challenge you to a duel. Oh, yes, I know the story. Yeah, oh, you do. It's All right, I'll just finish it for people that you know are listening so he was honor bound to accept the duel except the person who gets challenged gets to pick the weapon and the place <laughs> now abe lincoln was like six five yep the, the guy that challenged him to the duel was like five feet and change so he chose broad swords in six feet of water yeah now, uh, and uh, anyone who knows lincoln knew that there was a little bit of tongue in cheek there oh yeah <laughs> he was he had such a great sense of humor, and he was like, yeah, really? You re- you really want to do? Yep. Okay, here are the terms. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Broad great. swords and water. You're exactly right. Buster only, man. We appreciate your time, brother, and uh, enjoy your, your trip to uh, to check out the hero. Uh, I appreciate it. Take care, guys. Nice Thank Buster. you, Buster.